Okay, well, testing low-risk people is something most people don't recommend doing, but yet we're all in the U.S. required to tell, test healthcare workers. If you have more than six cases of TB in your hospital within a year, you're required to test all the healthcare workers, and by definition, uh, they're, they're kind of low risk. And uh, I'd like to hear some discussion about uh, both the rationale of doing it and how to, how to deal with that. We'll start with Dr. Daly. Uh, the rationale will probably take longer than we have for this, this conference. I, I do think that uh, you know, we know, if we use the U.S. as an example, uh, of a very low uh, incidence country, among our healthcare workers, the chance of exposure uh, is very small. Uh, so we are definitely screening now low risk populations. Uh, and when that happens, we are going to have false positive tests, no matter what test we use, right? So um, as we do this in the US and we learn more about how these IGRAs work in serial testing of healthcare workers, we may need to reflect back on our screening strategies in this country and think about it. Should we be doing early screening? I mean, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that right now. So I want to just carry forward that thought for just a second. So the specificity of quantiferon is 99.3 according to the package insert. Now that's excellent, but it also means if you test a thousand people who've been living on the moon and you know they don't have TB, they're going to be seven false positives. That's something we need to deal with. At my hospital, we have 5,000 employees. So that means we're going to get some false positives. So you need to be prepared for that ahead of time and you need to be prepared to, to, to how are you going to deal with it? Dr. Eisman, what is your advice to someone who, uh, who is dealing with this situation? Well, the uh, guidelines on preventive treatment or treatment of latent infection really said, don't do a tuberculin skin test unless you intend to treat the individual with preventive therapy. And therefore, you really can, with prior probability, say, you may be a hospital employee, but if you mow the lawn, you're unlikely to acquire tuberculosis in the hospital. So I, I think in some ways those guidelines were generated by two concerns. One was perhaps some degree of paternalism. You're our employee. If you get infected on uh, the job, we should go bend over backwards to make sure we detect it and protect you. The other part is if you are a healthcare worker in a facility and you have tuberculosis and you're working with people who have AIDS, who have organ transplantation and whatever, the possibility of an outbreak in a hospital is really horrible. So we have, I think, perhaps used the testing in excess. And we have enough data now that we can begin to focus down and, and conserve our assets. And I would suggest use a better test not the cheaper test. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rakelli, what's your advice to people who are uh, uh, dealing with healthcare workers with uh, positive uh, IGRA tests? You know, Tony, last summer in Rome, we had the horrible episode of a nurse of uh, working in a, um, uh, in a nursery with neonates. And she uh, has been uh, affected by active TB sputum positive, and uh, about more than 1,000 neonates were exposed because she has been infectious for several weeks. That's something that do not happen often, but when it happens, it's a huge problem. And it has been on the newspaper for a long time and now is still ongoing, and so all of these newborns, they've all been tested with the Nigra, and so now we don't know how to deal with it. So this is exactly what Professor Eisman was referring to, uh, when these episodes happen, uh, I think the hospital is a crucial uh, point and we need to be prepared to avoid, to maximize the avoidance of this episode and to protect the health cares and also to protect the patients, in particular if they are vulnerable like immunosuppressed or newborns. So I would strongly support the fact that we need to use the best tool that we have to screen this critical population. And honestly, to be honest, 99.3% specificity, that's quite high. Yes. I'm wondering how many tests we are using <laughs> in clinical practice with that kind of specificity. That, I, I don't know, but maybe not so many. So expecting uh, 0.7 non-specific results 
which means non-specific in a way that we are not sure that if they are really non-specific or we think they are very non-specific, I think is quite acceptable on a wide scale. Now we heard a lot of talk at this meeting about variability. If you repeat the test, you may not get the same result. And Dr. Daly delivered some of that information and there were others as well. So could you please comment on that, Dr. Daly, the variability of the test? Yeah. Or reproducibility, we heard these terms uh, argued about. Yeah, well, I, I, without going into the details of what all those terms mean, I, uh, you, know, you can look at the variability of a test in a short time frame, uh, minutes, hours, days, um, uh, go out a long time frame. And the terminology changes in terms of how we describe that variability. But I think what's very clear from data that we have um, uh, put together in a, in a trial that was supported by CDC looking at healthcare workers uh, with uh, two IGRAs, um, a skin test, and doing it every six months, all three. And after enrolling 2,500 healthcare workers at four sites in the U.S., um, what we found was there's variability. Uh, there's variability in the short term, there's variability in the long term. And this has been described by others. Um, so that's not a bad thing, that's just what the tests do. All tests have variability. But what is important is that we define that variability. And once we feel comfortable, we understand that variability. We can, we can develop algorithms and uh, approaches uh, to, to be able to under, you know, understand what to do in terms of clinical decision making. Any other comments from Dr. Eisman or Rickeldy on the variability issue? I'll, I'll take seniority, the privilege of. Um, the history of interpreting the tuberculin skin test goes back decades. And it was used in very, uh, in retrospect, in some clumsy and inappropriate ways. And it took a lot of experience over years and decades uh, to figure out what a tuberculin skin test meant, and even at that, it was somewhat vague. We're at the dawn of understanding the IGRA tests. I think already they promise, in my mind, to outperform the tuberculin skin test in virtually every setting. So I think I'm comfortable going forward and appreciating the variability and still using it with some comfort. Uh, and, but learning, we're still in the learning curve. Dr. Rakeldi? I can agree more than that. I think that the, the studies of, of, of that are being carried out by Dr. Daly are extremely important because they will, uh, they will just set the point for establishing how much variability we could expect from one test. So we need to expect variability from any test. I think for these tests, I think the variability is, is acceptable is manageable in clinical mm -hmm. practice. That's important thing. So what I want to know from a test, which is not hugely variable without any prediction and it can change in 50% of cases. That's not the case for these tests. So you know, there is variability, there is limited. It's probably limited to set things where we can manage it and quantifying, addressing that variability, I think it's very important at the moment. And from these studies, we'll have very exact information and will help us in using the test in clinical practice. Dr. Eisen, I may mention of the tuber uh, tuberculin skin test. We have been studying that for a long time and we use a change of six millimeters to be a significant change. But with the IGRAs, uh, Dr. Daly's study with T-spot was one, one spot. You go from below to above, it's a converter with quantiferon, it's 0 0.01 international units of interferon. Dr. Daly, what is your recommendation to people? When should they get excited and pay attention to a change? Uh, or what should we do about that? I don't know what to do. Well, I don't, I don't know that I know what to do, but I, I think at this uh, meeting, uh, we heard that people are starting to deal with this in their programs. So programs that have already switched over to do healthcare worker screening with their uh, IGRA tests, you know, they're seeing the same thing that we've been seeing in our study. And they're developing approaches. I think the most important thing is, I, I don't know what the right approach is right now, but whatever we do, we need to evaluate it, which is what we heard today from some of the very large medical centers in the U.S. that have been using IGRA for a while and are developing protocols. So for example, uh, one approach would be that if you don't think a small increase in interferon production above the cut point uh, is a true positive, you could repeat the test at some point. 
and, and that's a very viable option. Uh, I think we need some uh, direction on when we would want to do that. But uh, th this is something that is happening in practice right now. I'd like to remind us that Dr. Eisman uh, drew from his long, long memory and reminded us that Von Pick's study in 1909 published the first use of intradermal injection of, uh, of the, uh, these products. And it really wasn't until the 60s, 1960 or so, that George Comstock and Lydia Edwards and Phyllis Edwards really started to put some parameters. So it took them a little more than 50 years, almost 60 years, almost 60 years to figure that out. And Quantiferon, I think, came out in 2008. T-Spot in 2010, so this is 2012. So I think it's fair to say these are early years. Hopefully we'll take less than 50 years to decide <laughs> yeah, the cutoff right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I was encouraged, like Dr. Daly said, uh, we heard a presentation by Dr. David Mader, who analyzed his uh, data from the University of Illinois, where he had uh, many thousands, I think it was five or 6,000 tests. and. He found that if the, if the first positive result was 1.0 or less, that it was likely to be negative the second time uh, that the test was done. And better you should wait maybe one or two or three months to repeat it was the best time to see it. Dr. Tanasi from uh, the VA Palo Alto uh, analyzed again several thousand she thought if it's less than 1.51 that it was likely to revert back to negative. Those numbers are way over 0 0.35. So my question to you gentlemen is, what do you do with someone who's between 0 0.35 and 1.5? How, how do you evaluate, what do you do? Do you tell them tough or what? Dr. Daly, we'll start with you. I don't know the answer. Oh, he knows uh, the answer. <laughs> uh, I, well, I, I mean, I know that I, I know what we need to be doing to, to get that answer. Um, I, but I want I want to make a, a point. Both of those presentations uh, do, or, or those uh, physicians do that because they know they have low risk healthcare workers. Right. If there's an exposure, they don't do that. So th this idea that there's this gray zone or whatever you want to call it. Um, that could reflect some variability uh, in the in the host. Uh, um, we we think about that in the setting of this. These are low risk individuals, and therefore we are willing to wait to retest at some period of time. But I think it's very important to say if these are high risk, meaning there's an exposure, uh, then those cut points uh, I think should be respected. The current the current cut points. Yeah, thanks for correcting me on that because Dr. Mater particularly, but I'm sure Tanasi as well. We're very clear to point out that the first thing is a clinical evaluation. Then you fall back on the numbers. You think that's a good idea, Dr. Eisman? Well, yeah, I, I think um, we have an inevitable desire to have some objective validation of our clinical impression. Uh, we, whether it be emotional or the threat of litigation, um, peer respect, we like to deal with numbers but numbers don't exist in a vacuum and I think it is the challenge and also the blessing of working in clinical care that you can apply your intelligence to a laboratory value. Dr. Uh, Ricaldi, can you give us a European view on this? Uh, I'm, I'm not particularly a fan of any gray zone for any test. I think the gray zone is made by the clinician. So in other words, we have a 0.35 cutoff for the QFT, let's say, if I have a patient that has been bone marrow transplanted is 0.3, I, I probably believe that data is probably latently infected that will take some action. If I have a very uh, young guy jumping in the room just because he's coming for a screening, has no risk factor, 18 years old, coming from the gym, has 0.4, I will not care about that. Maybe I will not go to retest him. So it, and the concept of the risk, again, and the context in this case is, is, is a key. I think that will be the gray zone of the clinical judgment. But I don't like, in general, the idea of transposing that gray zone to the test because you will be risking that, let's say, you take a patient with 
you take a children with a leukemia is 0.8 and you ask yourself if, if you're actually in a gray if you ask if you are in a gray zone that would be a terrible risk of misinterpreting important clinical information yeah but you know I, it is it's, it's just a real problem because if you have 5,000 employees that you're screening every year and if you see that there is a conversion rate of six percent you, you have to figure out a way to deal yeah. with that in a programmatic way. And, uh, you know, I see that you can approach this clinically, epidemiologically, or within the laboratory. So the lab, you can say, okay, the laboratory is going to give us this gray zone. Uh, or you can use your clinical and epidemiologic data to help you interpret that. But you have to do something because in the U.S. we, we, we treat with a lot of isoniazid. And these people could get treated with isoniazid inappropriately because it's a false positive. So, I mean, I, I, again, I think that we learned some approaches that you can take to, to figure this out, and I look forward to, to hearing the results of those evaluations. We can go back in history as well. Uh, John Bass, who worked at Mobile, Alabama, and worked in, in New Orleans with uh, Bill uh, Bailey, they observed that if they did employee health testing, skin testing, that they had a lot of people who appeared to be newly infected if they used six millimeters increase in duration. And they said, and that was inappropriate, it was like 15%. Now both of those cities, New Orleans and Mobile, are <laughs> deep in the middle of the NTM country where there's a lot of regular mm -hmm. exposure. And they said if on the other hand we simply change the criteria for a conversion from six millimeters to 10 millimeters, it fell into the expected range of employee infection rate. So th this is how you, you use the test. You are appreciative that it's not the final iteration and we learn from it. Uh, but I, I, I th I'm perfectly comfortable going forward with the testing and uh, with the caveat that it's uh, not fully mature and we need as clinicians uh, to uh, appreciate the variables. Right. I want to underscore that. So what Dr. Eisman, what I heard Dr. Eisman say is the guidelines and the cutoffs are fine, but your judgment is better. So, you know, it's okay to modify things a little bit uh, for your own local situations. Did I overinterpret that or is that what you meant? I have always felt that we need objective data. I, I, don't want to sound like a cowboy that I, I always trust my clinical judgment. We, we gather data and we sit down and look at the patient and the circumstances and rarely, is, as Luca said, rarely is it tested as just binary. It's yes or no and you have to go forward. One, one hypertension when the patient is scared out of their mind doesn't mean you start them on IV antihypertensive drugs. And, and so I, I think um, and, and let me let me say by interrupting myself that people who are using this test who don't have a lot of clinical experience will not have very much comfort in interpreting. So they're looking for guidance, and that's where sometimes some professional discussion of the of the variables is important. But it um, it's going to be it's going to be difficult for a while. Dr. Daly, what would you recommend people to go to when they need guidance on these tests, interpreting them? If I was going to make a decision to switch my health facility to a whole new system, then I would want to learn as much as I can by, from those who have already done the same. But from an individual perspective, I mean, there are people in your communities. The, certainly the, the regional uh, TB centers would be one resource, um, but uh, there are likely others that have uh, been using these, these items. Anthony, Antonino, can we make these uh, centers accessible to people uh, watching this session? Is there some way, you, is there a you sure, we can put a link website on. or something like we that? We could put a link I on, be, I think they'd like that. Yeah. I don't think that's a problem. I know Dr. Lee Reichman runs the center in New Jersey. Yeah. He it would be particularly welcoming, but I, I, we can put them all on. Yeah. I think that that's, uh, that's definitely an okay thing. I'll get it, I'll get it okayed, but I think that's okay. a great idea. Well, I think we're concluding our one-hour session, so I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to make a concluding statement. Dr. Riccaldi? Yes, I think the concluding statement is, I think that uh, I, from these three days, I've, I've heard many presentations. I think it's, it's an extremely exciting area of, of, uh, of 
TB infection and of new diagnostics, I think that we are learning more and more every day in different areas. There is still a lot to be learned, but if I look back five years ago, we know that so much more today about these tests that we knew only five years ago. So I think that in five years' time, we're going to learn much more yet. Uh, I think that in most my, my taking home message today is that in many clinical situations we are probably ready to start using this test in clinical practice uh, without losing the information that using clinical judgment and no, having knowledge about the test it would be the critical point. That's why sessions like this, actually delivering correct information and knowledge, I think it will be critical for the correct use of these new diagnostics. Dr. Eisman, a concluding comment? Dr. Godola made an observation that kind of jarred me, and I should have thought about it more often. I should think about it all the time. He said, this is the only test we use in medicine in which we take a foreign substance from a pathogen and put it in the human body. <laughs> and it is, um, it is a historical accident that we've done it. Um, it. It strikes me as we have a pretty good record of safety, but it is maybe the least regulated, uh, overseen, quantitated test we do. I mean, uh, the, the literature about what antigen to use, whether it's applied well, whether it's read well, is absolutely staggeringly bad. John Sabarbro talked about inter-reader differences. You'd have reader A versus reader B, and they'd be off by a huge amount reading the size of the skin test. But the, but the U.S. Public Health Service also showed intra-reader variation. That is, they had the same patient stick their arm through a hole in the wall, and the person read the test an hour later and read it differently. And if you need any evidence that this is a wild variable, I mean, it's painful to me to compare a test with something that's as, as slapdash as a tuberculin skin test. I, I think it's time not to praise the tuberculin skin test, but to bury it. Uh, I think uh, we have to begin at this time forward to replace it with a test that is more reliable, objective, uh, and uh, more accurate. Dr. Daly, a concluding comment? Yeah, I think over the last three days, um, based on what's presented, um, what I came away with was that uh, we have better tests now than the skin test, and it's time to use them. Uh, I, I think we saw that there are uh, many people, many facilities that are using these assays now very successfully. Uh, we should learn from their experience um, and, and start using these tests because, as Dr. Eisman said, uh, you know, we, have, we have a better test now, those of Igris. Well, my, my conclusion is that the, these tests are indeed better, uh, and they're better in a very specific way. Uh, these tests are highly specific. Uh, and whenever we apply them, they give us a correct answer that is a negative test. In the vast majority of cases, particularly in healthcare workers, 85% are negative. So we remove those uh, patients from concern or issue, and we get to focus on a smaller set. And there, <clears throat> I think the take home message is to be a doctor, apply your clinical skills, apply your thought process and all the things you know, and make your best judgment. That's what doctors do all the time. We do that with EKGs, we do that with chest x-rays, we do that across the board. So this is no different. Don't give up your clinical judgment to the laboratory. Don't become a slave to a number. Use your brain. That's what your patients want from you. That's what you've been trained to do. And take CMEs like this one. <laughs> Thank you very much.